Hello and welcome to Beyond the Headlines. I'm your host, Justin Chenette, and today's ge uh, guests are from Equality Maine. We have Ryan Fecto and Brooke LaRoe. Welcome to the program. And we're here to talk marriage equality. It's an issue that everyone's really talking about now, especially with the decision uh, in New York to be the sixth state to allow gay marriage to take place. And we saw just this past week, it actually on Sunday, where gay marriages were actually performed in the city for the first time. So uh, it was a great historic day for a lot of individuals, but we're gonna get down to the topic and get down to the nitty gritty of this conversation being held in Maine with a potential referendum uh, on the 2012 ballot uh, to basically have a yes or no vote on gay marriage in this state. So so let, let's talk about this topic. Um, in 2009, uh, it was a, a defeat for marriage equality, 53 to 47 uh, at the ballot after Governor Baldacci signed into law gay marriage. Um, that was a significant defeat for, for, for your, your side. Why now bring this uh, to the forefront when just in 2009, just a few years ago, it was defeated? By at the ballot box, Ryan. What, what, let's start with well, you. Well, I think first and foremost, 47 percent of of Mainers, uh, who went out and v voted on during that election supported marriage for gay and lesbian couples. So I think that's still uh, encouraging and still an important important amount of support um, t to think about. Um, but, but it's important now because people are changing their minds. Their hearts and minds are changing on the issue. Um, we ha we've have three independent polls that suggest that 53 um, percent of likely voters for 2012 support marriage for gay and lesbian couples. Um, the support is moving in the direction of, of marriage for gay and lesbian couples and it's important that, that we recognize that and we, and we strive we strive for marriage in, in the state um, where, where people are changing their hearts and minds on the issue. Now, Brooke, um, in terms of changing the hearts and minds, do you, there are some polls that suggest, like, like Ryan said, that it shows more of a, a movement towards marriage equality in the state, while there's other independent polls that suggest otherwise. Do you think that there has been a shift in terms of the hearts and minds? And if so, how, how did it happen? I mean, how did you get from 2009, where 47 said no, to potentially now some polls suggesting 53% support it? How, how did we get to that point? Well, our strategy this time around is having conversations um, with voters and um, just talking to them about their opinions on um, same-sex marriage. And we're really focusing on the people who say that they would be in support of a civil union or domestic partnership because um, we found that those are the most persuadable. And we're having conversations with those people and finding um, that we're able to move them towards supporting marriage. So really focusing on those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Mm -hmm. um, now, while you canvass neighborhoods, because I know you guys both do that a lot, um, have you met some staunch opposition to trying to persuade some people that may be having a more religious foundation in their, their value system, that it, it's not so easy to move people on this particular issue? It's a very emotionally charged issue, as you, I'm sure, found out. Um, you know, how do you persuade somebody that's really dead set against it? Right. Um, I think a lot of those who, who have been, I mean, at least at the door, who are uh, really adamant about being uh, against it or, or whatnot, um, aren't those who, they don't sit there and have conversations you've, with for, with for very long. And uh, I, I mean, they're not, I, I don't, I've never been, you know, hurt or, or, um, or, or felt backlash from anyone. But um, for those who, who are maybe on the fence or maybe supporting a civil union, um, or a domestic partnership at the moment. Those are the folks we're having conversations with. Um, so they support some rights and benefits for gay and lesbian couples. Um, they're just not all the way there yet. And we're having those conversations and we're talking to them about the, the importance of, of emphasizing you know, the fact that the love and commitment between a gay and lesbian couple is no different than that of a heterosexual couple. And, and having, the, having these conversations where they're telling us about um, their own marriages uh, and um, folks that they know who are um, a part of the LGBT community, having those conversations, letting them open up to you and let them do the talking um, so they can understand the issue more. Um, I think that, that that's how we've been able to go about it. And um, they're, they're having conversations that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so, so they're thinking about something that in their daily lives they just don't think about. And then when they do, that's when, the, that's when you see the change. Now, Brooke, in your conversations with people and in, in trying to persuade them, has there been an instance that's, that's really kind of uh, rekindled your passions on this topic? Like you, sometimes when you're canvassing, it's kind of hot outside. It's kind of like, oh, goodness, is, is this really going to happen? It, maybe some self-doubting. Has there been like one particular experience that you can recall in canvassing neighborhoods that w after you persuaded this individual that was really dead set against marriage equality that has really been like very influential in t terms of your continuation with Equality Maine? 
Um, well, we just canvassed Kittery this past weekend, and pretty much all the people that I talked to were in support. There was one older woman that I talked to um, who was on the fence about the issue, and um, just having a conversation with her, she wasn't. I wasn't technically able to move her to. Um, s explicitly say that she would vote for marriage, um, but I think that what was really rewarding about the conversation was that she really ha acknowledged that she hadn't really talked about this before. She didn't really know a lot of the facts that I had been um, giving to her, and so I think that that sort of was very rewarding for me in terms of um, educating her on the issue, and hopefully after I left her door she was able to think about it a little bit more, and hopefully by next November um, she will have you know, maybe changed her mind, but I think just knocking on her door and having a conversation, it's just the start of that, you know, you don't necessarily have to change their mind right then and there, but um, a lot of people haven't even really talked about it or thought about it all that much, so um, that's why it's really important. Now, Ryan, do you feel, as elaborating on that, do you feel like when somebody knows a family member, a friend, a colleague that is gay or lesbian, do you think it makes the conversation easier? Do you think that trying to, to kind of move them towards marriage equality is an easier process when, when you know somebody, it's somebody in your kind of immediate circle versus somebody who doesn't interact with gays right. or lesbians? Uh, I think m most, of, most of the time that's the case. I actually had a conversation in Kittery this weekend with someone who, who had a daughter who was a lesbian and she was not, she was not budging on the oh, issue really? whatsoever. Um, even though she sort of recognized um, that in the future it's going to, it's something that needs to be passed. At the moment, she said there was, it was just not, um, it wasn't the time. But, but I think, yeah, I, I think conversations that I've had with folks over the phone, voters over the phone, I think that, they, that those who, who have something they can relate to, you know, those, when you, when you ask the question, you know, how would you feel if you were able to attend their wedding, that, that person that you know, um, most of the time that, that's a positive response. Most of the time that makes them feel good and makes them, makes them think, wow, I would, I would really like to see um, my friend, my family member, have, have the opportunity to marry the person that they love. Now, Brooke, um, New York uh, passed gay marriage in the legislature. It's signed into law. Um, gay marriages are now taking place in the state. It's the sixth state to do it. It's the most populous state to have gay marriage. How is that playing a role maybe in, in kind, of, kind of continuing if there is any momentum from that decision in other states, including Maine? Well, I think that when that happened, it gave us personally a lot of momentum. I know that the day after, we were really excited to be involved in this and felt like it, it put a lot of meaning behind what we were doing, and it gave us a lot of momentum in our phone banks and feeling like what we were doing um, was contributing to um, more of the whole. And so um, it made our work feel a lot more... Um, just meaningful and important and like um, we were just contributing to something you know more than just Maine. Right. Now Ryan um, you actually both of you were featured in the the Journal Tribune uh, talking about not only marriage equality but also uh, kind of the New York decision and that sort of thing. Now Ryan you said in here uh, in, in terms of co uh, talking about the New York passing uh, and you say quote I think it gives courage to people currently in the closet. And you actually had a conversation with your mother about this topic, right. basically immediately after the decision in New York. Can you talk a little bit about you know, your personal uh, process with that and, and how important is it for other people to right. kind of recognize that? Well, well I think for me, um, New York was just a, an expression of, um, of that the, the, the work that I was doing for the past two months is going to, is going to lead to something. And I think, I think it, um, you know, working on this um, day in and day out, it just seems like, you know, when, when will it end? But uh, I, I think that New York really, really showed, showed me and showed a lot of other folks that, that the, work, the work does have, has an end, and, and that end is, is uh, passing marriage for gay and lesbian couples, that, that success. Um, and, and personally, just, I mean, it was, it was motivation enough to, to come out, and I think that, um, I think that by by passing marriage equality and and other and other measures that that affect um, the LGBT community, I think that that shows acceptance. And until until people feel accepted, they're not going to feel comfortable um, com coming out. And I think we're seeing folks b become more uh, feel like they're more accepted in society, gay, the gay and lesbian community. I think that's important, and, and that's that's why I felt I felt the need to uh, come out. Now, do you guys think that there's um, kind of a demographic shift where you know a certain demographic, maybe young people, are more inclined to support gay marriage versus maybe what I call more seasoned individuals have a harder time accepting that sort of shift taking place, and as a result, making it more difficult to pass a marriage equality uh, in in this state in particular? Brooke, you want to? 
take that? I think that um, I have learned that you shouldn't make assumptions about people and a lot of the people that we talk to on the phones are older because Maine does have an older population compared to other states and so um, you really can't assume before you call somebody that just because of their age or their political party that they're going to say you're, they're gonna, you're gonna get a certain response from them because you really don't know what you're going to get and a lot of people um, that maybe you would think are, you're going to call them up and they're going to hang up on you. They don't. They're totally in support. And so, um, yeah, I think that you you can't really count on one one end of the population. You really need to um, focus on everyone as a whole because they're all, you know, all of their votes are important. Now, if, if you run across an individual that says, you know, I understand your point. I understand the personal, you know, uh, you know thing in, in terms of the involvement of marriage. However, you know, I'm steadfast in my position. I, you know, I believe in kind of the core Christian values and marriages between a man and a woman. I might be more inclined to support a civil union because marriage is more, in their minds, a more religious institution. How do you answer a critic that says, you know, it basically comes down to values and religion? How do you kind of, because I mean, religion is something that's not necessarily fact-based. It's more kind of what you believe in, not necessarily wrong or right. It's just that's what they believe in. How do you have a conversation with that? How do you, you know, kind of further that persuasion? Or how do you further that conversation? I, I think a lot of religious voters don't know that the state of Maine already has um, a law that, that, that doesn't um, force a religious institution into marrying a couple, whether they're heterosexual or gay or lesbian. Um, they, they, don't, they don't have to be forced to marry anyone, and there's no legal um, penalty for doing so. And I think when, when you have that conversation, a lot of, a lot of religious voters don't know that. Um, and, and furthermore, the, the language that we proposed to or submitted to Secretary of State um, is to also protect uh, religious freedom. So um, it, it really is a two-pronged issue, and I think that once folks um, understand that you know, their, their Catholic church isn't going to be forced into marrying a gay or lesbian couple, it, it opens them up more to the, to the issue. Now, Brooke, there's still folks out there that say the biggest detriment to marriage, the uh, sanctity of marriage, is gay marriage. What would you say to that? Well, I obviously wouldn't agree. Um, I don't think that gay marriage necessarily disrupts the sanctity of a straight marriage. I think that it just, to allow gay and lesbians to marry, it just reinforces the fact that we all share the same love and commitment um, in our relationships. And I think that it would actually strengthen the meaning of marriage if we, were allow, if we would allow everyone to be able to ha make that commitment to one another. Um, now, what about how does divorce play a role into this? Because I, in, when I, you know, see talking heads on TV or conversations around the dinner table, even, you know, that talk about, you know, the sanctity of marriage and that sort of thing, I think to myself, you know, there's a 50% divorce rate in this country. I would think that we want to really make our efforts focused in on something like that and, and correcting that particular component. If you're especially talking about families, now, how does that play a role in this conversation, Ryan? Um, the divorce. Um, I, I, I mean, I've done personal research and I've seen that other countries that have, have passed um, marriage for gay and lesbian couples across the board, um, their divorce rates have actually um, dropped. So I think that, you know, I think that there, there's obviously something there where, you know, these, these couples are, are staying in their relationships, staying committed to one another. Um, I, think, I think divorce is, is something that needs to be handled, I mean, specifically on, on its own. I don't, I don't know if there's a specific correlation between gay marriage and, and divorce, but I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, when you when you look at other countries that have had have, have had progress on marriage for gay and lesbian couples, the statistics show that you know the divorce rates have dropped. Um, mm -hmm. uh, now, Brooke, there's uh, was a, a from the 2010 consensus uh, census uh, basically said that there are more gay couples in the state living in the state, whether it be gay and lesbian couples in the state raising families in particular. Um, do you think that you know those sorts of numbers maybe help to dispel? the kind of maybe misconception that people have that gay and lesbian people can't have families because yet you know the influence of the kind of the male and the female are important to raising children how do you kind of talk about the family aspect of, of gay marriage well we like to emphasize again that the love and commitment is no different than a heterosexual couple and the same goes for a family in that you know gay um, parents don't raise their children any differently than a heterosexual couple and they can show the same love and raise their children in a, in a very safe and loving home in the same way um, that any other couple can. And I think that um, 
what you're citing in, in that get more gay couples um, are starting families in the state of Maine. I think that I'm sure um, that's showing a lot of people that um, that they can have families and they can be successful and um, hopefully that's changing their minds. Now, Ryan, there's a lot of terminology that's flown around uh, during conversations with marriage equality, whether uh, on either side, civil unions, marriage, so on and so forth. How do you define a civil union versus marriage in terms of kind of the legal benefits? Because even I have trouble trying to understand the difference, and I'm sure people out there voting on this issue have a similar concern. So how would you define the difference, the major differences legally through the right. state between civil union and marriage? Um, well, there, there are over a thousand rights and benefits that are included in marriage that aren't included in, in a civil union. Um, inheritance, um, health care policies, uh, tax, there's 148, I believe, um, tax um, provisions that, that specifically cite marriage and, and not civil union. So, I mean, those, those are the things that we're looking at here when, when it comes down to the, the legal definition, the legal terms that are, that are used for marriage and, and not for civil unions. And I, I think that that's an important thing to emphasize as well, that there's there's so many rights and benefits that are just not not there in the civil union that are in the marriage and, and that's important just just the same now Brooke what about just calling everybody a civil union unless you want a religious ceremony and then you call it marriage how about you know making it simple or everyone's a civil union unless you want a religious ceremony and calling that marriage what about something like that as opposed to having that back and forth about you know, what's marriage, is that more religious, is it not more religious, but having, like Ryan said, kind of equal benefits for everybody. Everybody starts out at the same level, the only difference is the religious component to it. Um, I think that I found that marriage, the word itself, is really a sticking point in a lot of discussions I've had with voters, and they do say that um, if you could just call it something else, then I would be totally fine with um, gay and lesbian couples being allowed to make that commitment and have the same rights and benefits. Um, but with marriage, it really has a lot of, besides a religious meaning, it has a very um, significant meaning in our society in terms of it being the ultimate form of commitment and love and um, just that sort of um, commitment that, one, that two people can make with one another. And I don't think that a civil union has that connotation. And so I think that's why it's so important that um, we have marriage and not a civil union. So it goes above kind of the legal benefits? It's right. really about the word? Well, I, I think the problem with, with the question itself is the fact that it, it assumes that uh, gay and lesbian couples aren't religious. And I think gay and lesbian couples, a lot of them are religious and they do want um, religious institutions marrying them. So I, I think it's important to emphasize that you know, gay and lesbian couples are not, not religious, they are. Actually, can you talk about that topic about uh, engaging or what you guys are doing in terms of engaging the religious community in this conversation, are there religious organizations that are supporting marriage equality? Um, well, the the uh, pastor Michael Michael Gray submitted the language to the Secretary of State's office from Old Orchard um, because because um, of his of his stance on on, on the terms uh, on the terminology that said we're protecting religious freedom. So I mean, there there are there are certainly um, churches out there and institution religious, religious institutions out there that are supportive of of our cause. Um, in fact, we. We were in Kittery this weekend canvassing, and we were hosted by um, Second Christian Congre Congregational Church in Kittery. Um, they provide us space and an opportunity to do our training and whatnot. So there, there are religious institutions that are supportive. Now, Brooke, I think it would be interesting to see kind of a debate back and forth between religious institutions about marriage equality. How have you ever like interacted with with kind of the both sides of that religious spectrum, where you have basically the same religion arguing a different point of their own religion? So, like, I really am inclusive about uh, you know gays and lesbians, and we really are supportive of gay marriage, and they're part of a religious institution, and yet you could have a very similar section uh, of people, still religious, still part of a religious institution, but believes just the opposite of that. How, how, how do you kind of weigh those options and couldn't that be kind of confusing for people that maybe practice that particular religion? Hey, there's maybe some divide here. You know, have yeah. you seen that? Um, I have seen that, not necessarily between our voters. I know that we've had one volunteer um, who did identify as religious and said that she had um, changed her mind on the issue she had previously been against. And then um, someone in her family, I think, was lesbian and was able to get married in another state, and she went to the wedding, and it changed her opinion on it. And a lot of the people that I do talk to on the phone um, that are religious and are Catholic, like she was Catholic, do have a lot of um, issues with it. But I think it comes down to... Um, 
whether people are able to separate their personal feelings about um, same-sex marriage from what their religion believes. And we were really emphasizing um, the golden rule. And I think that a lot of, if a lot of people who are religious um, practice that in their own lives and personally, personally have a connection to that, they tend to um, support marriage more than people who are, um, I guess they follow, the, they follow the scripture very closely and they're very by the book um, and they don't really um, want to talk to you about their personal feelings. They identify more um, strictly with the religion. That golden rule being treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, now, Ryan, during the 2009 election cycle, critics of gay marriage citing, uh, cited uh, about learning homosexuality in the classroom as a as uh, kind of a, a way to kind of steer the conversation away from what it was. Um, it didn't actually uh, explicitly say we're going to be teaching uh, homosexuality in the classroom in that 2009 law. It didn't say it in there. That's a fact. That isn't you know rhetoric on either side. That's just the facts. Um, now, and while that's not included in the language this time around, there probably will be people that say, I really don't want homosexuality taught to my five-year-old or however, you know, in elementary school, that's, I want to be able to do that when the time comes, if it's needed. You know, how do you approach that particular issue when it's, and it's clear that it's not in the law, but we have seen other states like California recently where they actually passed a separate law that requires, it's a state mandate to teach homosexuality history in the classroom. How, how do you kind of balance that? Because probably some people on the opposite side of your opinion is going to use that California decision against you guys. How, how are you going to balance that? Well, I think there's a huge difference between LGBT history and, and the, the terms that they were using back in 2009. I, I think LGBT history is going to, is going to be an important factor um, leading into you know, acceptance and I mean, it teaches um, everyone. I mean, if, if we didn't teach about black history, you know, wh wh where would we be today? Would we still have the progress that we've had on that, on, on those civil rights issues? I mean, that, I, think that's, I think that's something that needs to be answered and, and looked at in, com in comparison. Um, but I, I think when you look at, at the 2009 campaign, and, you, and you, there's, a, there's a video out there of, um, of, the, of the campaign manager from the 2009 campaign, the Yes on, the yes on One campaign, and he, and he says, you know, we used a lot of hyperbole, we, we, we exaggerated quite a bit um, on, on what we were saying, and, and I, think that, I think that's a point proven, you know, that, that they, they didn't exactly tell the truth in their campaign, and I think that's important to, to note. Now, Ryan mentioned um, kind of black history. Um, there's been kind of uh, an ongoing phrase, if you will, in the media at least, uh, gay is the new black. And, and how it kind of promotes the idea of the civil rights movement and, and, and of this generation, our generation, that this is really that civil rights movement. Do you see that playing out in, in specifically kind of you know, younger audiences that this is really their civil rights movement? I definitely would agree that this is the civil rights issue of our time. I think that a lot of young people have gathered around this and our generation is a lot more liberal, I think, than older generations. And you'll notice, I think, on college campuses that difference is not so emphasized as it used to be. And, um, you know, it angers a lot of young people that, um, you know, their friends that they see no difference. Um, you know, can't get married like they can, and I think that um, they really want to fight for this issue. Now, Ryan, how many signatures do you guys need to collect, and, and when's the deadline for that? Um, we need to collect 80,000 signatures um, in order to get on the ballot because there's a drop-off rate as well, so it's, I believe it's 57,000 to get onto the, to the November ballot, um, 80,000 to make sure that we don't have that, that drop-off that leads us, you know, a, a few short. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the deadline. There's still we're still working out the uh, the information from the Secretary of State's office and whatnot on, on the language. So, Brooke, do you th feel confident that those num that those number of signatures will be able to be collected uh, whenever the deadline may be? Do you think that that's something that uh, you guys feel comfortable with that number? Yeah. Be able to achieve. Yes, definitely. We've been we've been working with um, the same day registration um, voter voter veto. Uh, um, people's veto, and I think we're, we've we've learned a lot from from being able to work on that. That and, and it shows. I mean, they had a, a lot shorter of a window to do this, and and they they seem to be having success. I believe they hit their their fifty seven thousand mark this past week. Of course, they still want to get more um, to make sure that they don't have that drop off. Um, but I mean, I think we've learned a lot, and I think we're going to be able to use what we've learned. Speaking of same day voter registration, Brooke, do you think that? Um, that component uh, plays a role in the marriage equality debate. Do you think that if people don't have the ability 
to register on the same day as the election, mm -hmm. do you think that that's going to hurt your numbers in 2012? That was um, definitely part of why we were um, so involved in it, because if we didn't have same-day um, voter registration, it really would hurt our own campaign and our own vote next November, because we do have a lot of young voters who would take advantage of same-day registration. Um, and that's why we were um, really trying to get out there and get those signatures for that. And a lot of elderly folks, you know, folks who, who have moved from maybe their, their permanent residence to, to a nursing home or assisted living, and they have to re-register in, the, in their new town, and a lot of folks who move. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, it really does affect the, the electorate, the, ele the electorate, the, the electorate, yeah. electorate yeah. Um, quite a bit. I mean, t to think about um, having, having folks who, who have moved and probably support marriage, or young folks who, like Brooke said, who probably support marriage, or those elderly folks who support marriage for gay and lesbian couples. You know, we want them. To, we want them to have the chance to vote. And getting two days off from work is not very easy. Actually, I think there's a movement uh, in the country to change the election day itself uh, from a Tuesday to like a Saturday. But that's just kind of an <laughs> internal political thing. But um, but let let's try to reverse roles here for a second. So let's Ryan, let's start with you. Um, this may be a little difficult. State one rationale of the opposition that you agree with. Um, I, I think one rationale of the opposition would be that I don't think you know uh, a religious institution sh religious institution should be forced to marry uh, a gay or lesbian couple if they if they choose not to if that's not fundamentally their belief I support that and I think I think that we're we're, we're promoting that ourselves and I think that's I think that's important. Brooke, can you think of a different one? Oh boy. Um. That's a difficult So something question. from the opposition, so somebody who's anti-gay marriage, anti-marriage equality, can you think of something other than what Ryan said in terms of, uh, you know, allowing religious institutions the, ch the choice uh, to whether or not to have their ceremony there? Can you think of something else that you agree with with the opposition to, in, in trying to find that common ground? Hmm. It's a tough one. Yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, I haven't really thought about that. Um, I was going to use Ryan's answer. <laughs> <laughs> you stole it. Yeah. That's, what you did. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I mean, and the only reason why I push this is because a lot of times people get frustrated in election cycles where they see those 30 second sound bites basically attacking people. Uh, and it doesn't matter what side it is or no matter what group. And in that divisive conversation, turns away a lot of people mm -hmm. from, from at least listening. And no matter what side of it, they could be for marriage or not, uh, or against marriage, and they may you know, kind of block their ears from it because they're just the negative side of politics, as you know, Ryan, <laughs> majoring in political science, can be a little daunting with, with people. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in 2012. Now, if people want to learn more information uh, or even get involved with this, with this conversation about marriage equality and equality in Maine, Ryan, what can they do? Um, well, we have a, a website, um, why, marriage Ma why Marriage Matters Maine dot com. Um, and th all the information is there. We have um, an opportunity for you to donate on, on the website. Uh, we also have a, a Facebook page personally um, for, for York County specifically. It's uh, facebook.com um, forward slash EQME York. Um, and then, of course, our emails and contact information um, being our, my, first, my, f letter, my first initial of my first name, last name, at equalitymain.org. Same, same with Brooke. Mm -hmm. Now, Brooke, is there any particular uh, events being held right here in Biddeford? Um, that we can kind of tell people about right now? Is there like you have ongoing phone banks that people can get involved with, canvases, anything else coming up? Right, um, every Thursday from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. at our Biddeford office, we are having um, voter ID phone banks, which we've had really great turnout um, for us so far this summer. And um, in terms of Biddeford, that's what we have right now. Every Saturday, we're out doing some sort of action, whether it's volunteer recruitment, signature gathering, or canvassing. Um, that tends to be outside of Biddeford. But if people are interested in getting involved in something other than a phone bank, um, they can definitely contact us, and we'll let them know what's going on. Okay, so wrapping up our time together, what would you say to somebody who's undecided on this particular topic? So let's, Ryan, start with you. Okay, so pretend I am completely oblivious to the topic. It doesn't affect me personally. How can you persuade me in a very short, you know, 10 second thing to, to bring me to the side of marriage equality? Well, I think again, it goes back. Gay and lesbian couples um, share the same love and commitment as a heterosexual couple does for their partner, their, and their, their wife. And it's important that, that we give the same opportunities um, to, to unify that love that, and that commitment that everyone else has. Brooke? 
Um, well, like I said before, really emphasizing the golden rule and a lot of people, um, I don't know very many people who, don't, who wouldn't identify with that in their own personal lives and practicing and so um, really it is important to treat others the way you would want to be treated and why not give gay and lesbian couples the opportunity to marry um, if it's something that you enjoy in your own life. All right, well, thank you so much thank both you. for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. And good luck to your campaign. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I'd just like to mention one thing on this topic before we wrap up the program. It's something that I really just thought about this morning, actually, um, in my daily hustle and bustle. Um, uh, turn to your significant other. If you have a significant other, you're in a relationship. It doesn't matter if it's uh, gay or straight. Just turn to your significant other and look them in the eyes. Uh, peer right into their soul sort of thing and, and think about it. If you were denied the opportunity to signify your love with that person, the person that you love dearly with every fiber of your being, that you were denied the opportunity, not only through the state, but maybe through your own religious institution, because of your love for that person, wouldn't you be upset? Wouldn't you want to fight for those rights? Wouldn't you want to fight for your love? And I think that's important. When you personalize the conversation, when you eliminate the dehumanizing factors in the conversation, and what it's easy to do in politics, you dehumanize illegal immigrants, you dehumanize you know, uh, gay, gay or lesbian couples, you know, it's easy to dehumanize people. It happens in the military all the time, right? But in this conversation, it's as simple as your love for somebody else, two people having a love for each other. Look them in the eyes and think, if I didn't have that opportunity, you may not be married, but maybe one day you want to. If you didn't have that opportunity, would you be upset? Would you want to get involved? Now's your chance to do that. Thank you so much for watching Beyond the Headlines. I'm Justin Chinette. For more information on my career path, you can visit my website at justinchinette.com and check out my weekly column in the Journal Tribune. We'll see you right back here next week.